I've taught uh, world and American history for uh, 30 years for Centerville City Schools and early in my career started interviewing World War II veterans, inviting them to my classroom to, uh, uh, to talk to my students and you know, bear eyewitness to the, uh, the unit that we were doing. Anyway, that evolved into developing um, uh, video memoirs for World War II veterans exclusively. And so I was called in almost eight years ago to produce Jim's uh, video memoir. Anyway, we hit it off and have been uh, companions and, you know, and best friends ever since. And so we developed this um, presentation about five years ago and have given it in a number of different states and overseas and so forth. Um, and it's been, a, you can imagine, for an, an old history teacher, this is an awful lot of fun for me to get uh, to do. Uh, knowing Jim has given me entree to, you know, meeting uh, World War II veterans that I saw in books as a child, and uh, it's been a real honor for me. Um, I'll do a brief introduction to Jim, and then he'll tell you his story. Um, the best way to introduce Jim, of course, is to reference Band of Brothers. Um, Jim's one of the very last original Tacoa men who is still traveling and, and speaking. And, um, uh, of course, Band of Brothers focused on E Company, but same 506 Parachute Infantry Res Regiment of the newly formed 101st Airborne Division. Um, the division and the regiment participated in some of the most uh, noted operations in the European theater in the Second World War. Of course, they famously trained in Tacoa, Georgia. They spent about a, a, a year in England prior to the, uh, the jump into Normandy on June the 6th, 1944. Um, fought all the way through the Normandy campaign, 33 days, and then did the, the, the quick jump into Holland for Operation Market Garden, almost precisely 73 years ago, and then uh, uh, defended Bastogne during what became known as the Battle of the Bulge before ending their war down in uh, Bavaria at, uh, at Bechtus Garden by securing uh, the, the Nazi uh, compound there on the Ober Salzburg. Um, I think you're going to be uh, amazed at uh, what Jim, the story that Jim is going to uh, uh, tell you. And um, so without further ado, Jim Pee Wee Martin. Thank you for inviting us. It's quite a, quite a nice thing. You've got a beautiful building, a nice audience, and I, I appreciate that very much. There are a couple of things I'll have to tell you. First is, when this war started, contrary to what you may have read and heard, everybody wasn't in favor of it at all. I grew up listening to veterans from World War I, many who had been gassed, and I'd hear them at night coughing, and they'd tell them the tales of how terrible it was. So I decided, like the rest of the country, we became very isolationist. We'd been over there once, we're not going back. They can take care of their own problems. And I was probably one of the worst about that. This thing started. Most industrialists were doing about 10% of small military stuff, and they didn't want any more. We were coming out of a depression. They felt they were doing real well. People were starting to get a little money and they didn't want any more business. In fact, the government had to call a lot of the CEOs of companies to Washington and tell them, if you don't get with the program, we're gonna take care of you. You're either getting with it or we'll punish you. So they finally did. I had a deferment because I was working in a tool and die shop. We did tools, dies, gauges, special machinery. We had a manufacturing side that had 350 people in it. They started drafting men up to age 35 with three kids. 
I began to change my mind a little about that. Here I am, a young person with no family to worry about. And a lot of those guys over there getting drafted were friends of mine. How would I feel the rest of my life if they got killed and I had to face their kids? Another thing was Japanese thing. Now to show you how people can be wrong, I thought, shoot, that little dinky island is going to take us on. That'll be done in three or four months. Look how wrong I was. But I felt we had an ocean on each side. Nobody could reach us at that time. So I still wasn't going. Then we began to go down to the theater on the weekends and see the newsreels and listen to the radio and Hitler rambling. And it was evident that Britain and France could not take care of this alone. So I thought, we have to get into this. This was not a feeling of going over and helping them. It was a feeling of all the allies, Australian, Canadian, French, Polish, Russians, getting together, each country putting in what they had or what they could do, and we would go over and rid the world of a tyrant. He had grandiose plans of what he was going to do. And that didn't fit in with what all our allies wanted. So we did. Churchill wanted to go across immediately. And there were brighter people that said, no, we can't do that. We don't have the capability of doing that. We shut down all the war business after the First World War. We didn't have a lot of the machinery we needed. We didn't have the logistics at all. So that two-year period when we didn't get in made it possible for to do what we did. Finally, I saw that it was my obligation, and that's what I call it, an obligation to join. When you live in a country like ours, if your country is threatened, then you have an obligation to do whatever is needed. And my feeling was, if I was going to go, I wanted to go in the hottest outfit there was, and there were two choices. When I was five, I had seen a parachute jump at Bedford, Indiana at a county fair and thought I would like to do that sometime, not thinking of military service at all. The other thing was submarines, and I was really passionate about submarines. So I went down to the post office in Dayton and signed up for submarines. And then I asked the guy how soon I was going. And he said, well, you go home. It's going to be about six months. They're working on the sub that you will be on. Well, when I announced to Ed Johnson, the head of the company that I was working for, he threw a fit. He said, there are people out on that street would kill for a deferment, and you're going to turn it down? And I said, Ed, it really doesn't matter too much. I'm just a, an apprentice. And he said, oh, let me tell you something. These contracts we have are cost plus, and for every hour you're here, I clear $5, and I don't give a damn if you sleep in the rag bin. Well, I went. And when they told me I'd have to be six months, I couldn't go back and ask Ed to let me work another six months. So I went ahead and signed up for the submarine service. And as I told you, they told me it would be six months. Well, I wasn't going to do that. What could I do? So I went across 
the aisle and signed up for parachute duty. And I'm really glad I did. Now, I was actually in the Navy. I'd signed the papers. And I was sent to a place called Tacoa, which was starting a new regiment such as the world had never seen. After I'd been there several weeks, two people came from the Navy checking up on me at my parents' house, and my mother told them I was in the service and showed them the letters I'd sent home. And they looked at each other and said, well, if he's in the service, that's okay. Today you'd have a congressional investigation about that. <laughs> But that's how loose things were in those days. People lied to get in. We had one 15-year-old boy in our unit. We had a lot of 16-year-olds. So many of them lied. But if, you could go in at 16 if your parents signed up for you. But anyway, <clears throat> General Bradley had watched what happened to the Germans when they went into Crete. They took Crete but they suffered tremendous losses and Hitler never was very, um, had any use for paratroopers after that. He had very little use for them. Now Roosevelt didn't like army, he was Navy. He knew we had to have army, but he was not very happy about it. Bradley went to him and I don't know what he said or how they arranged it, but Roosevelt finally told him he could have the parachute if he wanted it. The only stipulation was that the colonel that was being charged, Colonel Singh, could have any person he wanted. He could have any, any place he wanted, anything he wanted, and the only person who could overrule him was Roosevelt personally. Now at that time, if an airborne or a, an aircraft unit or some special ground unit wanted a person from another unit, they could request it and take that person. The restriction to us was nobody takes a paratrooper. Once you're a paratrooper, you're always a paratrooper. Our unit, a regiment, is about 2,100 people. 6,500 people right out of a civilian life signed up for this. And that was another re requirement. They didn't want any old army people in to cause a problem with these guys that had never been in service. Prior to this forming of this unit, when a person joined up for paratroopers, he went to Fort Benning for four weeks and he came out a paratrooper. And they would send a few people to this regiment and some to another regiment. Sink had a different idea. He said, that, that's not what I want. He made up what he called a parachute basic from July 15th till December 1st of 1943. You took this basic and that's where the attrition came in. At the end of that period, that 6,500 had gone down to 1,650 people. The training down at Tacoa was so bad that you really had to be passionate to stick with it. Some people went out because they just couldn't cut the physical or the mental. And some of them cried when they left because they knew they wanted to stay, but they couldn't. Now the training, I'll tell you, it started at 4.30 in the morning, and didn't end until 5 in the evening, and then most nights we were out on night problems. So we usually around 15 or 16 hours a day, six days a week. I never even thought about quitting. Hank DiCarlo, one of our guys, said about this greatest generation, 
you should know we were not the greatest generation. Our parents were because they raised us the way we are. And I think that's true. Remember, this was a depression. Nobody had anything. And nobody ever expected to get anything. It had been going on for about 10 years. And we just, this was a normal living. Now, the training was hard. We had a, a training you went through every day that took a lot of people out. For instance, water hazard. They had a pit that was about three feet deep with slurry of mud in it, about 10 feet across. If you fell in, you didn't get to go change your clothes. You went through the rest of the day just like that. Every day, they were yelling about you and calling you names, challenging your, your manhood, saying you're not man enough to do it. The physical part was terrible. If you got hurt or broke a bone during that time you were out, any minor infraction at all, the discipline was really bad and immediate. We had what was called a sweat box at the guardhouse. If you did something the colonel didn't like, you were put in there for three or four days in bread and water. Now you can imagine in the summer, 100 degree heat, and you're in that sweat box. You went in there once, you didn't want to go back, so you did everything you could to keep out of it. This went on day after day. We come to actually hate this man. One day he had us on a hillside. And he said, I understand you people are not happy. No, you don't like the food. No. He said he was soft-spoken, never raised his voice. And he said, well, I'm going to tell you something. It's going to get a hell of a lot worse before it gets any better. He walked away, and that was the end of it. We had another session on the hillside one afternoon. And he said, one of you people sent a letter home to your mother telling you how terrible I was treating you. And I had a congressman come to see me about this. And I'm going to tell you, the next time a congressman comes to see me because of what one of you people said, he's going to wish he was never born. <laughs> and he walked away, and that was the end of it. Now, we had a lot of stressful pain, uh, training. We had to run a mountain called Kurahi. That's an Indian term, means stands alone. And that's what we were. We were a unit that stood alone. It's at 5,000 foot elevation that the camp is. And then this mountain goes up 1,000 feet above that. We ran that mountain four to five times a week in company formation, sometimes carrying a rifle. It's three miles up and three miles down. It didn't matter what it was sleeting or raining or whether it was 100 degrees, you still did it. Sometimes in fatigues, sometimes in swimming trunks. Now, Running a mountain by yourself is not too bad, but running in a company formation is. And this was, had been an old 3C camp after the first war won, and it was now empty. We took it over, they enlarged it. It wasn't finished when we went in there. When you came in, you slept in a three-man tent with a canvas cot 
And the first day I put my feet down there, I was ankle deep in water, a running stream of water coming off the mountain, going through our camp, every place. And the earth movers were running around all, all over the place, and with mud every place. And that's how we lived. There was a food shortage, deliberate. If you didn't get in there first, last eight or ten guys may not have enough to eat. May run the Curahi video and then we'll continue. Uh, he there. stops me. He's going to show you some of that. Have a drink, Walmart. You see how he babies me? to tell you something about this running. You know how all these fancy artists and people are that write and do pictures and everything? They have what's called an artistic license. They can change things a little. I'm actually only running I'm running 70% of what I was really running. He, he downgraded 30%. <laughs> I said, you know, it makes me look like some poor old guy that can't afford that can hardly walk. He sort of enjoys that. And I can still run. Now, when you go up this, this road, when we were there, was just a dirt road, and the water washed around. It was not really good. It's nice and now, as you can see, they grade it now. You run until you just thought you weren't going to be able to take another step. You go around to turn, you think you're all up to the top, and there's another big going up faster. Now here's my company. I took the picture. That's my company on the right going down. And that's eight company coming up. I had people tell me or ask me and tell me, well, when you got up to talk, how long did you rest before you went down? I said, you got to be kidding. <laughs> you turn right around and go. Some woman told me the other day, we heard that when you went up, they had a, a little post with a brass thing on. You're supposed to touch it when you turn around and go down. I said, there was no such thing like that when we went. That put up for the tourists. <laughs> Things have changed dramatically. And you'll see a lot of people going up, but they're driving up. <laughs> now, that's our guide on there. But I will tell you this, as I look back on it, and some of the guys have asked me recently, what do you think is the best time of your life? And I said, the time we spent in Tekoa. As hard as it was, as miserable as it was, I look back on it now with a great deal of satisfaction. There we're practicing on the mortar there. That's where we're living in, tar paper shacks. Now, when they came in, a lot of guys at that time wore long hair down to their shoulder. Well, as you can see, they're losing it. And some of the guys actually cried when they cut their hair off. That was me. I wasn't very big. I was, a, at that time, weighed 135 pounds, was five, seven and a half. Most of them weighed around 
145. Now those four guys you see there, they did something wrong that day. So they had to spend two hours after the rest of it quit with that thing on their back full of rocks. That's one of the milder punishments that happened. Now you see those, all those bags out there. We're getting ready to go down to Fort Benning. Now the Japanese held a record for Force March, 118 miles. The first battalion rode all the way in trucks. The second battalion went from Tokoa to Atlanta. They broke the record. Our battalion said we can do better than that. So we did. We took a train down to Atlanta and then walked down to Fort Benning, 136 miles. We still hold that record. Second Battalion still puts out the information that they hold the record. They did for two weeks. <laughs> and that's always been a bone of contention between us. About the last five or six miles, our battalion commander said, you guys look like hell. Now he was walking along and every step he took there was frothy blood coming out of his boot over the top and running down. We'd drop out and go up and watch it. It got to the point he just couldn't go anymore, so he ran and he went in his stocking feet. Where did we sleep at night? Alongside the road, rain and sleet, temperature about 28 degrees. The wind was so bad that they couldn't keep field kitchens going, so they fed us peanut butter and jam sandwiches. That's all we had. Well, when he told us that we looked terrible, we straightened up, we went in that, we looked like a real outfit. They said we could all have the week, weekend off. Very few people took it. We were just crapped out. Well, Fort Benning was a four-week training. You'd go in there, and the first week was all your physical stuff. Well, the first battalion went in, and they ran the drill instructors ragged. They would mock them, and they'd turn around and run backward. So they decided that the rest of us didn't need that kind of training. We took the three weeks, and then we left. And then we went to Camp McCall for further training, tried all, all the new things that somebody could think paratroopers could do. Some of them turned out we didn't. This is one of them. They were telling you how to land and also to guide your chute. Now, when you're coming out of that plane, you get 15 people out of there in about eight seconds. And you're only 500 feet above the ground, so you don't have much use for trying to steer the thing. All you're thinking about is getting the ground with your equipment, period. So some of those things were just thrown out. We did our training there, then we went to Fort Bragg and took some more training. And then we were going overseas.